Fish Den 365 Productions presents Bass Tackle Storage Solutions. Hello everyone, Fish Den 365 here. Welcome to my tackle den. This is the place where I store almost all of my fishing tackle. The only thing I will not store in this area is my fishing line and that's because fishing line, especially monofilament, can become very easily damaged under temperature extremes, especially hot temperatures, and it does get warm in here in the summer. I don't have any way of controlling the temperature, and therefore I will not store a fishing line in here. Uh, and that's a recommendation for you. If you're finding that your line is breaking and you don't understand why, it could be because you're storing it in sunlight or in very hot temperatures. And so if you discover that you're doing that, uh, you can stop those line breaks by storing it in a cool, dry place out of sunlight. Monofilament especially is susceptible to damage due to sunlight and temperature extremes. So this is it. This is the tackle den. This is where I store all of my fishing tackle, all of my lures. I have a number of different ways of storing them. I have a whole methodology for what I do, for what you see behind me, how it gets on these walls and how I back up what's on the walls. And we'll get into showing you that uh, shortly on the video. But first I thought I'd tell you a little story about how the tackle den came to be. So I had a friend who's a fishing fanatic like myself and he had an 18 and a half foot bass boat that was stored in this building. He called it his boathouse. And he wanted to get a bigger boat. He was upgrading to a 22 foot boat and he was looking to have a bigger storage facility for it because it would be very difficult to fit that length of a boat in this, in this uh, tackle den. So I have an 18 and a half foot bass boat that I really enjoy using. It's not in here now. Right now I have a 16 foot bass boat in here that I use for local fishing and some of the smaller waters that I like to fish. And my other boat is stored at another location for the summer. But he asked me if I had any interest in, in uh, having this boathouse. Previously, I had that bigger boat just underneath a carport, and I, really, I never liked the protection that only a carport provided. It, it just wasn't enough, in my opinion. So I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. He was willing to sell it to me for several hundred dollars. I think it was $800. And so I purchased his boathouse for $800, the people that he bought it from, they were willing to move it from his location to my location for a couple hundred dollars. So for a thousand dollars or less, I was able to get this, this great facility here, this tackle den to store all of my tackle and to house my bigger boat and keep everything protected. So it worked out really well. So my, there's been a progression when it comes to how I view storing tackle and how I prepare for a fishing trip. Um, whether that's fishing a tournament or just fun fishing somewhere or going on vacation like I will be soon. I used to, when, I, when fishing a tournament, I, I used to feel like I had to have everything that you can imagine available. Does that ever happen to any of you? Do you feel like you have to make, better make sure you have everything packed and ready just in case when you're fishing a tournament so that you're ready for any situation? Well, I found over the years that I was really wasting a lot of energy and space by in, on my boat, especially by doing that. I, I'm not saying that if you're fishing tournaments on the professional level, if you're in the Elite Series or fishing FLW tournaments, I'm sure it makes sense to be very careful about what you're packing that way, that you have all your bases covered and that you know for things that you may not be able to predict, you want to make sure that you have the tackle available. And these guys have the wherewithal and the means to do that. They have large boats that can carry a lot of tackle. Some of them have trailers that their boat goes in or that their tackle can be stored in and, and mobile while they're fishing tournaments. So if you're on that professional level, it's a different story. I understand that. But for a lot of us who fish local tournaments, which is something I love to do, uh, it's really not necessary, and, and I'll go into this with you, and my, my evolution in, in how I store tackle and how I came to that uh, point of view, and also what it's done for my fishing results and, and the success that I had thereafter. But there was a time where I didn't feel secure unless I had a gigantic plastic tackle bag um, that I could barely carry. My, my spine is crooked today, probably because of me carrying that tackle bag to and from the boat. 
<laughs> fishing <laughs> tournaments or even fun fishing, feeling that I needed to have every crankbait, every, every jerk bait, every soft plastic bait that you can ever imagine re at the ready in case I needed it. And uh, over time I realized that I was probably causing myself uh, what I would describe as, I'm looking for the right word here, I, I think you can get spun out mentally because of it. And the next thing you know, you're, you're focusing on the wrong things. You're no longer focusing on where are the fish, what are the patterns, how do I present my bait. You're no longer focusing on the nature of the fish, the location of where, they're, where they are, and what presentation worked for them. Instead, you're focusing on, man, I got to make sure that I have this color Senko in case I run into this situation, or uh, I have to have my box of spoons in case I find a 30-foot spoon situation and and you know you can make yourself crazy thinking of all the possibilities because there's just so much today in bass fishing that's available so many different tackle and uh, so many different lure and bait options today right so it's better uh, I think to just understand a few other things and then pare down your your selection and then focus on the actual fishing at hand rather than trying to be ready for any situation that you might come up with or trying to find the absolute best pattern. There's always more than one pattern going on on any lake or system at any given time. And so if you're fortunate enough to have a process to find a pattern that works, then, and you know that and you found it, stick with it. And it doesn't mean that you don't fine tune it and make it better. It means that you, you learned it, you make it work, and, and you fish the moment. Um, on a lake because conditions change what happens today may be different than what happens three days from now in the summertime especially you'll find that a lot of the patterns are, are quite reliable that they last longer before they change but even in the summer things change over time locations change one of the lakes that I fish for example in early to mid June they tend to do some weed control they want to get rid of the milfoil and so they either use pellets or spray to kill that milfoil well, I can tell you when that happens, that changes some of the fishing because now the fish are forced to do some different things. The weeds are no longer green, they're dying off, they're not providing oxygen. Those areas are no good anymore where before that spraying or pellet laying took place, they could have been some of the best areas in the lake. So there's always the need to adapt, but you can do it in a much more simple way. So the next thing I'd like to do is give you a deeper dive into the tackle den. So we'll, I will change cameras and we'll just kind of narrate all of the different stories that I have here. So we'll go through in much more detail what we have hanging on the walls, what we have in some of our tackle storage bins, and why we have what we have and what the methodology is, what the process is for us to replace what's on the walls, have what's ready on the walls. Basically today, I have two tackle boxes and I'll show them to you when we do the narration portion of this video. And the tackle boxes are not huge. Uh, they're not tiny, but they're not giant. They don't need to be for me. And it's funny because I've come full circle. Probably the first tackle box I, I received, I was probably about eight, seven or eight years old. And my dad bought me my first tackle box. It was an old pal tackle box over the years. I've added others, Plano, Flambeau, a number of different companies that make tackle boxes. But it's funny because that first tackle box, that old pal tackle box that I had, is probably about the same size as what I currently use today. And I also use a, a soft-sided bag, I'll show that to you too, that I put my soft plastic baits in. So my soft plastic baits are kept separate from the hard baits which are in the tackle box. Both of these things are not very large, they can fit in small compartments in my boat so that I can have good organization. I found for me personally, it's much better to have my boat organized and to know where everything is than to have a giant tackle bag and all kinds of tackle and bags of, of lures and soft plastic baits all over the place and not be able to find anything when I need it anyway. It's much better to just be simpler about it, make sure I have some of the right categories of baits for where I'm going to be fishing and then make sure that I have it at the ready and know where it is. And so that's what this is about. When I go into the narration, you'll see my approach to how I do that. And I think you'll find that uh, if you try this methodology, I think you'll find that it makes you a better fisherman because it keeps you focused on really what matters most. And what matters most isn't the amount of tackle or lures you have on the lake with you. What matters most 
is figuring out a way to get the fish to trigger, to trigger those bass uh, when you're out on a lake. And there's three things you need to do that. You need to understand the nature of the fish and what they're doing in the season that you're fishing in. You need to figure out the location they're likely to be in, which is based on the nature of the fish. And then you need to figure out a presentation that will trigger that fish into biting. It's that simple. It's those three things. That sounds simple and it is simple, but it's not always easy to do. And we'll talk about that a little more as we go forward. Okay, we're looking at the wall of lures here. And the uh, first lures that you're seeing are a number of different topwater baits. Right there's a variety of uh, poppers and walk the, dog, walk the dog type baits. What I do is everything on the board, they're basically my go-to baits and they feed the tackle boxes and those tackle boxes are utilized for the specific water or system that I'm fishing. As we move over here you'll see some more walk the dog baits. There's some Lucky Craft Sammies, there's some Zara Spooks, and then we move into some lipless crankbaits. I like ripping lipless crankbaits in the grass. There's rattle traps there. There's Lucky Craft, Strike King, Cordell, a bunch of different lipless cranks. Some flat-sided crankbaits there. Some minnow lures there. Those are high floaters like, like red fins. They're good for stripers and bass in certain situations. Some different crankbaits you're seeing there now. Some DD-22s from Norman. I like those a lot and some more there and as we move up you'll see that uh, there's a variety of cranks for different depths there's a number of Rapala DT-16s there we have some swim baits and some ripple and red fins right there good for stripers and we have a number of jerk baits and minnow baits here uh, pointers Rapala X-Raps different Rapala baits um, I also like to fish the bomber long A's. Moving along, you see that we have some more cranks. You'll see I have a lot of crankbaits. Got some spoons there, some flat sided crankbaits. And then we start to move into some of the square bill, the fat square bill type cranks. Also, some more swim baits up top. Some buzz baits there to the left. I like the Cavatron from Lee Bailey. Some different cranks, some more square bills, and some flat sides. And then we also have the Rapala Shad Wraps, which are great cold water baits for bass, and a number of spinner baits. I like the Nichols spinner baits quite a bit, so there's a number of those there. But these are the baits that uh, feed the tackle boxes. And look, last look at some of the buzz baits, and then we'll go to the soft plastics. So I have a number of soft plastics that I like to fish. These are my go-tos, basically. I have a number of zoom baits that I like to fish. Um, obviously, I like the brush hogs. Uh, we've got some debugs there from Konami baits. We have a number of net bait pack of chunks and pack of craws. There's some more debugs from net bait uh, from Konami. Sorry, we have. Reaction Innovation Sweet Beavers, they're great baits. I like to throw those in weeds particularly. Got some Yamamoto uh, grubs and double tails there. Some more of the pack of craws and pack of chunks. And then we have the Smalley Beavers down below. These are different size uh, beavers from Reaction Innovations. And then we're getting now into uh, Mismo Tubes. I'm a big Mismo tube fisherman. Uh, I like the Mismos quite a bit. So you'll see I have a number of different uh, color options there, from mostly from Mismo and some others. And then we have some of the old Zoom trailers. that They're plastic, but they match the old pork rind type trailer for jigs. They, they work very well, especially in colder water. Got some top water stuff here, some frogs, some toad type baits. Got some hair jigs there, and then I have a number of Cabin Creek salty spiders, and both small and large. I also have some man's baits there, some soft plastics from the, the Stingray Grub from man's. Then I get into a number of Senkos here of all different colors and sizes and shapes. Senkos are uh, a must have bait, they, they work in so many different situations. Some more double tails there. Some smaller baits here. Some of these are for drop shotting. There's some missile craws, 
The gulp is great drop shot bait. I got a bunch of Berkeley gulp. Got some different uh, drop shot baits as you're seeing here. And then we're going to get into some of the more soft plastic jerk baits. So you're seeing a, a number of finesse fish, um, those type baits. The zoom version. Some, some different swim type baits that are soft plastic. And you can see I have quite a few of, of these soft plastic jerk baits in different shapes and sizes. And then as we move over, we go, we get back into some of the swimming type worms uh, that I like to Texas rig. Right now you're looking at Sibyl uh, soft plastic swim baits, jerk baits, and then a number of the larger uh, seven and a half to ten inch worms that I like to fish, and some different hooks and jig heads that I have for them. Then on the other side, uh, this is the opposite wall. This is close to the door. These are Jean LaRue biffle bugs. I like those a lot. So they're close to the door because I reach for those quite often. These are swing impact fats from. Kitek, a great swim bait. I fish these quite a bit. They're close to the door also. And then I also have some Huddleston grass minnows thrown in there and some Huddleston weedless shad baits in there. Also very good baits, but you can see I have a variety of the Kitek uh, swing impacts and also some of their other swim baits. I'm a big zoom horny toad fisherman, so there's a ton of horny toads on the opposite wall here from the door, um, along with a number of other uh, frog and toad type baits. I also like the Yum Wooly Hogtail as a jig trailer. They're hard to find these days. I have to get them on eBay, but they're great jig trailers. Not many people use them for that, but for me, they've been very effective. And then some Bastrick minnows there also have. Here's uh, two boxes. One is filled with various jig heads of all shapes and sizes, tube jigs, all different types. And then the other is various hooks and lead weights for Texas rigging and sea rigging and all of what you would need for that. I have a cabinet here that has a number of different tackle items in it. I think here in a minute I'll open the drawer for you or some of these drawers and show you what's in here. So this is just a cabinet that I have that has more baits in them. So we've got a number of backup Nichols spinner baits in there. It, down here, I have a bunch of classic uh, Dances eels. These are old Dances eels. I bought a bunch of them. I thought maybe one day they'd be worth some money. And then I have some different baits here. You can see uh, Bomber Long A and some other uh, baits that uh, I just have storage there. These are Blue Stripers, Cordell Blue Stripers. Excellent striper bait. They're also good smallmouth baits in certain waters. I have a bunch of them in there as extras. You, They're very difficult to get. In here is a important box for me. It's a it's a deep vertical bait box. Basically, it's spoons and blade baits. And I'll set it down here and open it up for you in a minute. But this is a way that you can fish slow, fast, in a, in, in a certain respect of speaking, where you can throw in 30 or 40 feet of water and quite quickly vertically jig these type baits, a spoon or a blade bait. So they can be very effective in finding fish a little faster than some of the other baits that fish deep water. Here are a bunch of boxes that are, um, they have lures in them with no hooks. Most of the hooks have been pulled all these out of these lures. And the reason for that is I can fit a ton more lures in these boxes if there's no hooks on them. And these are basically the backups for what I have on the wall of baits. So if I lose a lure, let's say I have a Norman DD-22, I leave, lose a few of those that are on the wall. These are all the backups. I'll just pull them out of here, put hooks on them, and hang them on the wall. So these are my backup baits. I have a bunch of minnow baits and jerk baits. I'm always fishing those uh, since I was a young kid. Here's another box of minnow baits. All of them are marked, so I know what's in there. And it's just a matter of pulling them out, opening them up, and replacing anything that I might have lost that's on the wall. Or experimenting with something I haven't tried before. I've got a lot of baits in here that I, I haven't even fished in the past. And so every winter I look through them and, and experiment a little bit and then decide what to try in the spring and summer. Some more jerk baits here of different variety. And let's see, so you can see I have some top waters there. And looks like I'm pulling the top waters out. Here's some, these are older style top waters. 
bunch of Zara spooks in that one and some poppers, some homemade poppers that a buddy of mine has made for me. And then uh, some, uh, some common uh, pop R's and those type of baits. This is just a look at the top of that. I have some different things in the works there. And then I have some empty storage boxes, so I have room for more. I have about five boxes that I can still put lures in. And then here I have a number of others. I have jig skirts in these. I have stone jigs in these. And then this is the tackle box that I usually use when I'm fishing a lake or a tournament at a lake. I like these top bins because they can hold some things like these Texas rig weights and uh, bait keepers. On the other side, I usually have drop shot type uh, items. So here you can see I have some drop shot weights in there. And also I've got some of these football head style weights with the hook attached. Opening up now, you can see this is set up for one of the lakes that I fish in southeastern Pennsylvania. There's some top waters on top, some Sammies, uh, a Norman top dollar. I've got some crankbaits down there. A lot of these are deep diving crankbaits. They work good at this particular lake, and I have a number of jerk baits for fishing the points. So this box is actually set up for one of the lakes that I'll be fishing. Um, in another day or so and it'll be a practice event for a tournament that's going to be going to be coming up and so this box is ready to go Got some line on the bottom some hooks and scissors uh, hook sharpener that's what that Revlon nail file is that works great as a hook sharpener eventually I will make a video and and uh, show you how I sharpen hooks there's a way to do it there's a proper way to do it and an improper way so we'll show both here's a little box of jigs I love fishing jigs and uh, this is a man's stone jig. I find this particular jig to be very versatile. It comes through weeds well with the triangular head, but it also fishes on rocks. It rocks back and forth on rocks and, and hard bottoms very well too. So it's a very versatile type of jig to use. Along with each tackle box, I have a soft bag and that's where I put all the soft plastics. That was a weight that I just pulled out of the pocket there. That's a plug knocker. With a snap on it, you just drop it down and you can knock your uh, crankbaits free if they're caught in a brush pile. These are the soft plastics that I have in it. You can see I have some 4.8 inch Kitex there. I've got a number of sweet beavers. I've got some Jean LaRue biffle bugs, some D bugs. That's all I really need for the lake that I was fishing. I have very much confidence in those baits. This box is a smaller box. It's it's right now set up for a different system. It's actually set up for a river, a local river that I fish that is loaded with small mouths. So you'll see that there's a number of smaller baits in here, baits that fit the food items that are in the river. And then here's the soft tackle bag that I have with that. Again, with the baits that I'm fishing in the river, you can see there's some Kitex here again, but they're smaller. So folks, that's it. That's the tackle den and how I store the tackle and how I approach selecting baits for any given place that I'll be fishing. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy this video and you thought it was helpful, please hit that like button. Also, please subscribe to my channel. And the next video that I'll be putting out will be a video on the methodology for taking this tackle uh, and taking these, the baits and my selection of these baits to a particular lake that I'll be preparing for a tournament for. So it's a, going to be a, a three hour Thursday evening tournament. Um, and you'll see that uh, how I approach practicing for that tournament. I'll have four hours to practice and we'll go over the entire methodology and thought process for doing that. And then we'll see how we do on the day of the tournament. All right, remember, Fish Den 365 here, we're certified, classified.